questions. Now I am thrilled to have Professor Ed Hess. He uh, has asked me repeatedly whether I had him for the podcast or other conversations to refer to him as Ed. I will I will honor that. But he is a professor uh, and a, a distinguished emeritus professor at University of Virginia, Darden. He spent years also in D.C. Uh, with his uh, wife, who is a Georgetown grad. So I say she has that over Ed, which is wonderful. Uh, Ed is writing right now his 15th book. And uh, three of them I have read and I love. So we're going to keep the focus on one of his most recent ones. Uh, Hyper learning, how to adapt to the speed of change. A couple of his other books also, Learn or Die humility is the new smart don't you just love those titles they say a lot about the kind of person that ed is and he uh besides and in addition to his work as a professor he has studied and worked with a lot of different organizations from top fortune companies to the u.s military some of the conversations that I've heard you have, Ed, have been with uh, special forces and others that were recorded. So it's wonderful. And we are really thrilled to have you share some of your thoughts with the leaders at Leadership Greater Washington. Thank you so much, Ed Hess. Well, thank, thank you for having me. So I'm going to, uh, in essence, break down the conversation. The first part of the focus being primarily on leadership. Uh, and on this learning. Why is it uh, that you believe, Ed, that we need to learn more and at a faster rate as leaders now than we've needed to before? Because the pace of change is faster and faster and the pace of change is being driven by technology. And technology is getting smarter and smarter. And technology is going to be take over many tasks that we human beings do. And so the workplace is in the, the workplace is going to have to transform, if you will, how it adapts to all of that technology. How does it stay flexible? How does it stay adaptive? And we're going to have automation of jobs, all right? Uh, substantial automation of jobs. And so what happens to those people who have those automated jobs? What's the role of business in retraining people to be able to do other things? And so this whole concept that, that technology is the driver that's underlying business success going forward is mission critical. And the reason that people have to accept the fact that that's going to happen that enables them to sort of sit back and say, okay, what do we as an organization, what do I as a person need to do in order to stay relevant in the workplace, in order to have meaningful work, all right? Meaningful work and meaningful relationships equals happiness, all right? So we can go all the way down to, do we want to basically be happy? Well, if we have work, we are more likely to be happy. The challenge is, is that Humans are going to be needed to do the type of work that technology can't do. And that's basically higher order thinking, critical thinking, innovative thinking, imaginative thinking, making moral judgments, okay? Rote thinking or just doing things, the same task over and over again, all that's going to be automated, all right? And so can I basically think in ways that technology can't think, all right? Then the second way that, that we humans have a differentiator from technology is our emotions. Jobs that require high emotional engagement with other human beings are gonna be jobs that are going to be hard to automate because we technology is not at the place of where technology can be emotional with someone and make someone feel good about themselves or feel treasured, honored, et cetera, et cetera. Really, when we come down to it, ultimately the biggest differentiator between human beings and technology is going to be our emotions. So, okay, what does that mean? Well, it means that we as people, we as organizations 
have got to create the right emotional environment in our workplace, which allows us to be able to do those higher order types of thinking. And two, we need to help people learn how to manage their emotions, how to basically manage their negative emotions and how to generate positive emotions. Because the biggest human challenge going forward in the tech, in the, what I call the, you know, hyper, you can call it the smart technology era, right? The biggest challenge is going to be managing our emotions because of the stress of change, because of the pace of change, because of the volatility. The biggest void in our society today is the lack of critical thinking. Critical thinking is gonna be mission critical no matter what your job is going forward. Because as things change, you have to adapt, all right? Innovation is going to become very important. And so all of this sort of comes down to how are we as humans going to adapt to this new technology era, which is in progress. And the best Technology people, the smartest technology people basically say by the end of this decade, there will be very few cognitive relative tasks that humans will be able to do better than technology. So it's when we don't know the answers is where you need humans. Humans will be great explorers, great innovators, great creators. Humans also will be more will be better at emotionally relating with other human beings and going going forward i tell i tell companies the main critical difference between your company being successful and not successful is going to be the quality of the conversations that take place in the workplace and, and i i love that and let me let me I just underline that uh, the differentiator is going to be the quality of the conversations that you have in the workplace. I absolutely love that statement. So the question I have for you, though, is whether it is through technology, whether it's hybrid work or in-person work, how can we have better quality of conversations in our work environments so we are able to adjust in our teams and organizations to the type of change that you're talking about? Two things. First, the work environment has to be a psychologically safe place. All right. My friend Amy Edmondson, the leader on psychological safety, has written about this for decades. I'm going to have the courage to speak up, speak out, to ask questions, to say I don't know if, okay, I feel safe, all right? And so psychological safety is mission critical. It has to be an emotionally safe place. Now, why is this important? Because we know, we know that the pace of change and the amount of data that is knowledge that's going to be created. Technology is going to create knowledge so, so fast, we can't absorb it all. We know that most work is going to be done in teams, small teams. We know that the small teams that are the winners are able to develop collective intelligence, all right? And we know the science, the science of collective intelligence from MIT and from Carnegie Mellon two great engineering and computing science schools, all right? MIT started it out, did five research studies, same results, and Carnegie Mellon said that can't be correct, and they did three and got the same results. Now, this is going to be shocking to a lot of people, and I'm not trying to shock anybody because the answer is doable, okay? But the research of those eight studies, they all found that the best collaborating teams are teams that have five women and zero men. The second best are four women and one man. The third best is three women. You get how this is going, 
All right. Now, every time I say that, and there's a male listening, they cringe and they say, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm smart. Look, I got this great job. Okay. I'm making this much money. Um, this is just, it's just crazy. No, but it's, it's, it's our approach. All right. It's our approach. And so we, we as men have got to basically be, get to the point where we can say, I don't know. All right. Or I need, let me, let me test my ideas with you. And all of this is learnable. Okay. All right. The biggest competition every person listening to this podcast is going to have going forward is not someone else. It's inside of them. We have to take ownership of ourselves, our mind, our body, our emotions, our behaviors, our words. When we do that, then we can be part of high performance teams. Then we can learn. And that requires that emotionally safe environment. And it's, it's sort of counterintuitive that in the, the great big business world, it's got to become more emotional in order to be successful. It, and, you know, not that, cog, you know, not that cognition is not important, but it's, that's a key component. Why? Because the technology is going outsmart us if cognition is the game. It's emotions that will be our differentiator. And in working with people who in the beginning said this was crazy, you know, two years later, you know, they call up and say, you were right. Our performance is off the charts. Our people are happier. We're innovating better. We're having better quality conversations. And there's ways and methods and methodologies that you do that. And so that's the, that's the, to, it's so hard for people to understand that the biggest human challenge in this new world we're going into, this world of radical impermanence, social divisiveness, okay, geopolitical issues, we can go on and on and on. The biggest human challenge is gonna be managing our emotions our fears, our stresses, our feeling of inability to basically keep up, our inability to be at peace. And what's so fascinating about all of this is the answers go back thousands of years to the great philosophies and the great religions. And those answers have been basically ratified by modern science. The way to be, the way to manage oneself is the science today is the same philosophy that goes from history. And in our country, we haven't made it an a, a, a important thing to basically to study philosophy, et cetera, and study the principles that underlie all of the great religions, all the seven great religions when you research them all, have very similar, if you will, behaviors that are necessary for happiness and success. So Ed, the, the world around us is changing at a faster rate. And uh, uh, for anyone who's interested, I also think Azim Azhar has a brilliant book, The Exponential Age, talking about the exponential technologies that are about to hit that exponential curve, which we as humans have a hard time uh, grasping, that will cause significant change in the coming years, uh, whether it is with artificial intelligence, 3D uh, printing, some of the biotech, some of the ethics that comes around all of these things. So it's going to be tremendous change. I don't necessarily want to spend a lot of time talking about the reasons for the change, it will be there. It will get a lot faster. So we as individuals within these teams need to learn to handle it better. One thing you mentioned is the need for psychological safety and would love to revisit that later. But the other thing is that we need to work on ourselves as leaders. But you also mentioned that we are not naturally good learners. So I, I think like all of us as um, 
leaders in LGW, like when you talk about humility is a new smart, I'm like, well, I'm I'm pretty humble, you know. It's like or <laughs> or learn learn or die. I, I'm I'm doing my learning. It's for other people, right? The, so Ed, I'm uh, great great ideas. I'm gonna gift your book to someone else. It's not for me. <laughs> so you say you say we are not that great at it ourselves why not the way we're wired we're wired to go out into the world and seek confirmation of what we believe all right that is we don't see things that we don't believe we don't process things that we don't believe we are basically and we're, the reason our brain works that way, it's saving energy. It's saving energy. And, and so we're not that open-minded. We look for ratification, all right, of what we're doing. When our views are challenged, we tend to react to three Ds, deny, defend, deflect, all right? <laughs> we, we basically define ourselves by what we think we know. All right. And so what does that do? That means our ego is wrapped up in being right, correct, smarter than someone else. All right. But it's the way we're wired. We are we are highly efficient ratifiers of what we know. <laughs> we're highly inefficient explorers of what we don't know. Does that make sense? It's, it's beautifully it's beautifully said I have to keep telling myself Ed is not talking to someone else he's talking to you mom <laughs> I think all of us need to need to do okay. that it's hey, us it's us it's not someone me. else talking to me too talking to me too I mean in and, and it's and it's it's basically giving people a story that helps them redefine themselves and that's the five new smart principles that are in the humility book. And I'll just, I'll just read them and bear with me. I'm defined not by what I know or how much I know, but by the quality of my thinking, listening, relating, and collaborating. Bingo, change the game. It's not how much or what, it's by the quality of my thinking, listening, relating, and collaborating. My mental models, my story of how the world works are not reality. They're only my stories, okay? We all think that what we believe, everyone should believe. I'm not my ideas. And I must decouple my ideas, my beliefs from my ego. Don't identify with them, all right? Don't identify with, I'm, you don't, you know, I don't have to defend. In fact, the smartest people are the people who basically seek out disconfirming information all the time and go around asking people, what am I missing? What am I missing? You know, what am I overlooking? Do you disagree? All right. I must be open minded and treat my beliefs, not my values, as hypothesis to be constantly tested and subject to modification by better data. And my mistakes in, in our, our opportunities to learn, all right? And it's sort of like, that's the new definition of new smart, where old smart was big ego, closed-minded, defend my views, seek confirmation. I know, I tell, and I'm my ideas. That's old smart, new smart. Quiet ego, open mind, I'll test my views. I listen to learn, not to confirm. I'm good at not knowing, okay? I ask questions. Mistakes are learning opportunities. And I don't identify with my ideas. I identify with the type of person I am as a human being, whether I'm a kind, care, caring, compassionate human being, et cetera, et cetera. And when people can make this transition, the world completely changes. The world completely changes. The performance in companies that I've worked with, performances have increased dramatically in two to three years. 
I'm talking about earnings, okay? I'm talking about stock options, okay? I'm talking about all the stuff that people generally care about. Well, you know, and what, what I'm advancing is, is that we humans, in the, in especially in the era we're in now, means we need to excel at learning, unlearning, and relearning at the speed of change. And that requires human adaptation. And that requires others. We can't do it by ourselves. And that's why the team concept becomes so important. And, and we have to, in the team concept, treat everyone with respect and with dignity. And yes, there's hierarchy. There's going to be a boss. There's going to be somebody who makes the decision. But everybody has to feel comfortable that they can speak up, speak out. And of course, I'm being respectfully, okay? Nobody's talking about you know, bad manners and stuff like that. Um, and all of this is learnable and doable in the companies that basically have put in processes, work daily work processes, a new way of working to, to basically take this science and it's, it's ratified science. It's not science that I created, it's ratified, okay? That can take this. It's amazing what happens. And, and you know, it, it, it also, uh, what I observe is that it takes practice. So my uh, suggestion and thought to everyone is that, first of all, there's an element of having a growth mindset around this, saying, I am not and we are not there yet. One of the frustrations that uh, I see um, a lot of people have in organizations and teams is Again, people nodding and saying, ah, yes, we are open to feedback in our team and everything else. Well, when that's not really the case. So what I would encourage uh, everyone watching, listening to do is to start out saying we are not there yet. I'm not there yet. Mm -hmm. So how can I, how can we improve in this? Because I, I, I also serve on a bunch of different boards at it's incredible how our traditional patterns of thinking and behavior of due to respect and other factors keeping our thoughts to ourselves still govern the way people interact and then don't bring out the best quality out of the team conversation so I, I, my challenge is for every individual to think for themselves and their team and organization we are not there yet so what are the aspects i need to work on and we need to work on yeah and and those those aspects are highly emotional and really get down to the psychological safety part and it's it's interesting uh, organizations companies that i've worked with those companies that adopt a very simple process at the start of each meeting a check-in process and at the end of each meeting a checkout process and they basically do those processes rigorously i mean there's there's it's no skipping all right no matter who's in charge of the meeting and the check-in process just if, you know it's short you know the whole the whole thing takes just a couple of minutes but you know, you go around the room to the meeting and basically everyone answers these questions. How are you feeling? Where are you emotionally? Where's your head and heart right now? Are you here? Do you have a quiet ego? Do you have a quiet mind? Are you in a positive emotional state? Which you is sitting at the table right now? Are you ready to be your best self? And people come up with their answers, all right? Then you do a deep breathing exercise for one or two minutes, all right? And some firms then add on a short meditation, but taking deep breaths, all right? Either the Navy SEALs box four or coherent breathing, whatever, it's easy. 
And then the third thing that happens, okay, everybody give a big smile to the person sitting close to you. And you know what happens when someone smiles at somebody? The other person automatically smiles back. And that basically releases positive chemicals in your body. And those positive chemicals have shown to basically be, if you will, we'll call it I'm safe chemicals. Okay, until somebody screws it up in the meeting by, by behaving badly. Okay. And then the end of the meeting, how's everybody feeling? Okay. Has this been a good meeting for you? Why, why not? What are your personal key takeaways? How are you leaving this meeting? What's your mindset and how do you feel emotionally? So those are those are uh, great practices, Ed. And as you mentioned, I also know of a lot of high performing teams, including for people when they think about the US Special Forces or military, they think about these rough and tough individuals and they are rough and tough in many aspects but uh, uh i have interact with a lot of uh, uh navy seal teams and captains and they go through this process so it, if they go through this process we can get our right. teams to go through it i want to be mindful uh, uh there uh, karen it's wonderful that karen has uh joined live sheet she is a leadership grader Washington member who now lives in St. Louis. So that one of the reasons, Karen, we love having uh, the opportunity for virtual conversations is you can join. So I'll, uh, she has two very different types of questions. One is about schooling. So what can elementary, middle and high schools offer or teach to our students so they have the qualities as they grow up and enter the work world? And what can families and parents do um, at home so their children are growing up to have the qualities you talk about? This is the first question. We'd love to hear your thoughts before going on to another one. Well, there's what we're talking about in the business world now is basically been talked about in the education world really 50 or 60 years back, all right? Uh, the leading work those many years ago was done by three education professors and psychology professors for the National Education Association. Uh, and it, you know, one was Carl Rogers, and one was Arthur Combs, and the other one was Abraham Maslow. And they're all positive psychologists, if you will. And so, this, the, from a school perspective, what needs to be done is, is well known, all right? It's, it's what are the obstacles for doing it and the ways of doing it. And those obstacles in many cases is the lack of training for teachers to do it, all right? Um, and then it's also, and depending on the, where you live and everything, and the type of school it's the, the timing and the being able to being able to operationalize it all right but this is this is well known it's just not operationalized and what it means is is individual student learning it means small teams it's not memorizing stuff all right it's not basically you know taking tests it's active learning it's learning by doing, all right? And it's having people work on stuff that they want to work on and you use that, con that, that opportunity to basically instill in the ways of thinking and asking questions and the ways of emotionally responding and, and managing what's going on in your side. Um, and, I'm, you know, and there are some schools that do a great job at this, it, 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 it varies so much. And, uh, and, and that's why it's so important for parents, all right? And that varies so much because there, you know, there, are, there are parents working two or three jobs to have their children in, you know, in school. And then there are parents that are not working to you know, have the time. And so 
our system is such that there is no one way to do it. And unfortunately, our system is such that the more money you have, the more likely you can do it. And, you know, and that is a, that is a, a big challenge in our, in our education system. Yeah, so it's definitely one of those things that uh, needs to be addressed. Now, the other part of what uh, Karen mentions, which, by the way, she said she's moved to Seattle. It's great that you moved to Seattle, uh, Karen. Uh, I, I wonder that's a little bit of that sorting that your other question also addresses. Karen says uh, uh, that I imagine uh, a lot of times when you talk about get disconfirming views these uh, issues come up. Uh, you're not talking about Fox News to hear the other side, are you? Um, how do we talk to those who don't have the same beliefs and core values? Yeah, well, if you look in my judgment, my humble judgment, and that basically is probably not worth the nickel that's on your desk. The biggest void in our society is the lack of critical thinking period, exclamation point, underlined, et cetera. What we, what we haven't done in our society is teach people how to basically think critically. And that means look for information which is disconfirming. So how do you do that? You, you do that by having conversations with people. Uh, okay, what, why do you believe that? Yeah, and then why do, you, why do you believe that? How does it all hook together? And what would, what would make you wonder whether you're doing the right thing? What, what facts, what facts would say that, no, this is not right? Oh. Have you looked for those facts to see if they're there? Oh, no, not really. I says, well, do you think it would be good to check them out? Because if they're there, you're wrong. Uh, well, maybe. Then people don't have a, people don't have a thinking model, all right? You know, and you can think there's, there's, there's lots of models, but it's, you can have just six or seven questions you ask yourself when I'm thinking about something, okay? Wow. Why do I feel so strongly about this? Why do I know this is right? And you go down. It's interesting. For a couple of uh, schools, I did some work, some pro bono work, and gave them a list of critical thinking questions. And there was a list that had about 20 questions. And then I put the teachers in teams of five or six and said, I want you to come back with the team's top six questions that should be asked all the time. Every time I did that, the teams requested extra time. Every time I did that, when the teams came back, all right, the teams were not in a good place because they believed so strongly in those questions they liked and not coming to compromise. And, 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 and that's with, and then I'm not, this is not just a teacher issue, it's a human issue. We have to basically accept the fact that what we believe is just our story. And there's a lot more out there. And how do we go out there and explore? How do we basically love exploring? How do we love finding out what we don't know and changing so we are better? And that takes time. That's not memorization. That's not getting test scores. So the school system can send in the reports, okay? We, we, are, we are too focused on trying to basically judge performance instead of creating performance, right? And that's, that's, a, that's a major system. And you can go around the world and look at the great school systems, the great public school systems, such as Finland. Study them, read them. They are generally different than the way we, we, we do business. And so 
it's something that's solvable. The difficulty is, is that each geographical, each county, each city raises taxes to pay the schools to, to form their schools. And so you've got, I don't know how many, you know, hundreds of thousands of entities that have got to make judgments on what, how do we teach? And you're not going to get similarity. You're not going to get best practices all the time. It's a system, it's a system which was created for a different time and a different reason than the time we live in now. Just like our business organizations that have a survival of the fittest approach were created at a time when, quote, that worked, all right? Not that it was ever good. Now we're at a time where that is the fastest way to basically irrelevance. And, Does that and, make sense? Uh, yes, and the, the, the point I wanted to make is that getting those disconfirming views, uh, if we get for a second out of the uh, uh, political arena, even in teams and organizations, it is really, really hard. It is very, very hard. And uh, I work with executive teams and CEOs that would tell you they encourage feedback, they encourage open disagreement. However, in reality, for a whole host of reasons, that's not the way things work in their teams and organizations. So that's where I, I go back to, uh, we do seek out information that confirms our previously held beliefs. And in many instances, we reach conclusions really fast and seek that part of the point that you are making is when the world was more stable. And when you think about it, a generation ago, uh, uh, people could have held jobs for dozens of years. Two generations ago, they could hold jobs for their entire career. Uh, three generations ago, or four generations ago, people stayed in the same line of work, whether it was farming or making pottery for generations. So the same way that has accelerated, all aspects of work have accelerated. So when the world changed at a much slower pace, we could continue gathering data that confirmed our previously held beliefs without being put at a disadvantage. When the world is changing at a much faster pace. We are at a huge disadvantage when we seek constantly those confirming beliefs. And I see a lot of it, again, in many teams and organizations. I do want to jump to a question that uh, Tony also uh, asked when you were talking about the behaviors and practices in the organization. He says that uh, these are new behaviors that uh, we must learn, but it may, it may take time. <laughs> it does, Tony, believe me, it does for all of us. How do we give our team members the space to grow and make mistakes while they change and evolve? Many times people may shut down if they convey information in the wrong way and are criticized in a public uh, or unconstructive way. Well, yeah, people, anybody, any, sure, somebody's going to shut down if they basically are um, ridiculed or, in a, you know, or the reaction is not in a, uh, the reaction doesn't have to be, you're right. The reaction has to be, I respect what you're saying. Now let's explore it. And why do you believe that? And then you drill down, you have a process. Um, no, this takes time. All right. I mean, uh, organizations I have worked with, it, it generally, it takes time, but it takes discipline, which means that the ways you want to work in the workplace, you, you have to basically at the beginning of a meeting, read through that list and then say, is everybody in? Anybody got a problem with anything? Is everybody feeling safe? Okay. The fact that I tell you you're safe, you know, that's that's not that doesn't cut it, all right. And if people say I'm not safe, you deal with it. And so it gets to be, um, it's not it's it's not 
rote. It's not uh, a fast, just, okay, we'll do this for two minutes and we'll be in good shape to go. No, you've got to go where the people are and bring them along. The key thing is at the end of meetings to have a measurement practice, okay? What was our goal here? Well, our goal was to be I'm just making some things up. We wanted to be open-minded and to challenge whether this was a good idea or not. Okay, all right. So everybody bring out your piece of paper and write down on the paper who exhibited open-mindedness and acceptance of disconfirming information, willing to test it, who did not, okay? And you basically, the team grades itself. It takes two to three minutes. The fastest way to basically change behaviors is to give feedback at the time the behaviors are happening and to work through those things, all right? People in the beginning say, gosh, you know, I only got an hour for a meeting. You're telling me I'm gonna to have to do this for five minutes and this for four minutes and this for three minutes and this for two minutes. Yeah, that's what I'm telling you. You have to trust me that it's gonna work. Let's try it, all right? And lo and behold, you know, this is a funny word for a senior executive to say, you know, they'll call up and he or she will say, you're right, this is magical when this works. Magical, all right? Because the quality of everything, which means that yes, it'll slow down for a couple of weeks or maybe even a month, but when it clicks in, the speed and the quality is so much better you more than catch up. The ROI for investing the time in daily practices and holding people accountable in a positive, you know, well-meaning way, okay? Speaking up and it's just sharing with people. And then the other thing is it works very well when each team member has an accountability partner. They choose, will you partner with me? You give me feedback after the meeting and I'll give you feedback that works magic too, all right? Because we can't do this by ourselves. There is no successful team made up of five individuals. There are only successful teams when they are made up of five co people who are believe, who believe in the same way of being and are on that journey. Does that make sense? Yeah, and, and the point that you mentioned, Ed, uh, where having that culture of feedback uh, is really important, whether it's on the overall team or to the individuals. And it's one of the areas where uh, at least a lot of teams that I see uh, don't do as good a job with. And they mistake psychological safety with uh, people all being respectful, which they should be. But the point to that I want to highlight is that psychologically safe teams have very low social friction. Uh, there is great relationship and connection, and there is time that is built for that. Extremely high intellectual friction. And that uh, consistent recognizing, appreciating, and encouraging the challenging of each other. So part of what uh, you're mentioning, Tony, it does take a lot of effort and time. Uh, and what I would say is find ways. How can we reduce that social friction, which is strengthening the bonds, the relationships, the connections, the way people interact with each other, the respectful way that uh, Ed was talking about? And how can we encourage intellectual friction, intellectual disagreements, which oftentimes doesn't happen uh, partly because we are concerned about it impacting the relationship. So that's something to keep in mind. The other thing uh, Ed, that you mentioned that I think connects a little bit to this and uh, one of the superpowers is you talk about meaning making conversations and the importance of those in the work environment. Can you talk a little bit about that, please? Making meaning conversations are, you know, basically when I'm listening to someone and when you're listening to someone, 
we are taking in what they're saying, but we're basically processing it and it's being influenced by what we believe, all right? And so making meaning uh, means listening, learning to listen in a way that you have inner silence and you're not basically thinking of your answer, you're not thinking of what the response will be, whatever, but being totally silent and trying to hear what they're saying. You only learn how to make meaning by doing the following, by saying, okay, let me tell you what I heard. Is this what you meant? All right, now on something like, you know, would you like to have another cup of coffee or something? I mean, that doesn't play. We're talking about having conversations, but basically saying, this is what I heard. Is that what you meant? Okay. Or saying, I'm not sure I understand what you mean when you say this, but asking questions to clarify what you mean. And that becomes then becoming vice versa because the worst thing you can do when you're trying to take collaboration to its highest levels is, is when someone stops talking, you immediately respond with your, your result, your answer, your difference, your question. Because that is basically arrogance and ego that you think you're smart enough to really understand what they're saying when probably most people don't really understand what they're saying as clearly they are, and that needs to be fleshed out too. And so it's this, it's this slowing down and saying, okay, um, you know, this is what I heard, am I right? Or what did you mean by this? And let me go back to your CEO comment or your leadership comment. A CEO or a leader saying to people, you have psychological safety, okay? is not worth one penny, <laughs> it's not worth one penny. He or she can say it every meeting. It's how that leader behaves. So that leader will say, do we have a psychological safe zone? And everybody says yes. And then somebody will say something that took courage to say. And it's that leader's duty to say, excuse me, can I just stop here? I just want to applaud you. That took courage to say. That's what we want from all of us, okay? To have the courage to speak up and speak out. And, and we will all, all right, help each other do that. I mean, it's sort of like, you know, it's, you know I've never met a, an, an executive who doesn't say, we, I have a psychological safe organization. <laughs> I've, I've never one, never met one who said that basically, um, I can't, I guess, say the words that would say the opposite of psychological safety. But you don't, it's, it's the questions, it's the drawing out, all right, getting underneath it, okay? I mean, I feel safe, all right, when a person shows me, okay, that I am safe. Not when he or she tells me I'm safe. <laughs> the key is all of this is behaviors. It's how you behave, granular behaviors. And that's the missing link in so many organizations. Everybody's got the word. You, you can't go find a company or an organization that says we don't believe in psychological safety. You can't do it, okay? You can't do it. But I guarantee you the vast majority of them, okay, don't walk the talk because they don't slow down to embed it in their own way of being, okay? Yeah, and uh, what I would challenge everyone to do is to think about or even uh, uh, have someone observe how many real disagreements there are in meetings, what happens with disagreements, whether there are disagreements when, real disagreements, when the person with the highest status in the organization uh, or in the room says things. So uh, th there are ways to look at it, 
uh, Tim Clark has done a lot of research on psychological safety, and he puts uh, 9% of the teams and organizations at the challenger safety level, psychologically safe, where people in the team are have the kind of relationships where they are actually challenging each other. Now, Ed, this has been an outstanding conversation. I do want to get you to comment or talk a little bit about something. Uh, uh, we've, we've gone longer on this than uh, I thought because it's been of real value. I know though, you are also writing uh, your 15th uh, book right now. You have studied a lot and you have been looking at research and data with some of the turmoil that we are facing politically and otherwise here in the US. For anyone who hasn't read Ray Dalio's book, Ray Dalio has a great book. He is the hedge fund manager that had started Bridgewater, uh, which is one of the top uh, hedge funds. And he has the book Principles, uh, which is great on uh, some leadership aspects, but this one is Principles for Dealing with the Changing World Order talks about extreme turmoil that we are going to face. So I would love in the last uh, four or five minutes, some of your thoughts for us as leaders in the community about the potential challenges or turmoil, and hopefully on a positive end, because when I read uh, Ray Dalio's book, it brought me way down talking about real disturbances that uh, are ahead in our future here in the US, what can we do as regional leaders to make a positive difference through this turmoil? Well, I, I think we have to first accept the fact that there, the, term, the turmoil is, is going to continue and the turmoil is going to be multivariant. It's really gonna be fast-paced change driven by technology, uh, increased social divisiveness, um, challenging geopolitical issues, climate change, et cetera. Uh, and it goes on. And so, and then we have to sit back and decide how do we as a country, is it possible for us as a country to get at a place on these, this reality in this new way of being that's required, the new stresses that's gonna happen in our society. I mean, the number of people who's, who's gonna have jobs automated by the end of this decade is potentially huge. What are we going to do for those people? All right, what are we going to do? That's just one issue. It's, it's coming to grips and, and coming up with a program or a plan of how do we as a country want to be? How do we want to behave? What are our policies going to be? And all of this needs to be planned out and be available to be put in process before the end of this decade. Because every smart person I've talked to have said, the end of this decade will look nothing like the start of this 2020. We don't have acceptance of that, all right? Our political system is not built for that type of acceptance, all right? Our political system is built into federal government, our state governments, and then our uh, city, county governments, all right? So we have four levels, all right? That's not a recipe for fast change. The change is going to occur faster than we will be able to adapt if we don't sit back and think, how do we basically deal with this more quickly, all right? I think that's that's a huge issue. I mean, if you just take the US military and basically sit back and think about what is war fighting going to look like? It's not even 10 years from now. It's already started. 
going to look like in five to six years? And what does that mean for the type of people we need? How many people we need? What type of processes are we going to have? Are we going to have four different services? Does that make sense? There has to be people in state, county, city government sitting back and having these conversations. If all these smart people, and that doesn't include me, all these smart people are predicting this, all right? And NSA is, 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 is predicting this. What do we need to be doing? How do we come together? And there's going, there's going to be there's going to be new structures because it's going to take new structures in order to adapt at the pace of change. Okay, who in the world is doing a good job at this? Now, okay, well, we don't really want to have a you know a, a, a system like that. Okay, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to become China. All right. Who in a democratic country is doing a good job? What can we learn from them? Can, could you, have you ever, ever heard of a US state, federal or local leader saying, let's go learn from another country? <laughs> and so what gets in our way is our arrogance. What gets in our way is our divisiveness. What gets in our way is our culture, which still exists today, of survival of the fittest. That has to go in the trash can if we're going to become a country, a community that is going to be a leader in this world that is upon us today. Well, those are those are beautiful uh, uh, words, uh, and I would highly encourage people to follow you on LinkedIn. You are writing about this uh, again. There is a lot of turmoil, so we can, as individuals, learn with humility at a faster rate. Our teams and organizations need to do that, and we need to, as community leaders, do that in our communities and in our country, because the change, pace of change is picking up. Really appreciate you, Professor Ed Hess, sharing your thoughts, your insights with Leadership Greater Washington leaders. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank, thank you for having me and all the best to, to everyone who's listening. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate you and look forward to seeing you in person or at the next one of these conversations with Lisa Gable. Thanks for joining.